This is what we're going to talk about today. Um, what we're going to do for the rest of the year. Uh, we'll talk about the main subject, which uh, is photo storage. And then I've got a couple of little slideshows at the end uh, for the photos that you submitted. Uh, we're not going to do that because uh, our guest isn't here. So uh, what are we going to do uh, for the rest of the year? Well, I mean, it's very timely that we're talking about this today because obviously the announcements today kind of were in line with what the committee had decided anyway. Um, and that is that we're going to continue with the Zoom sessions. We're not going to try and have face-to-face -face meetings this year other than a couple more outdoor meetings that we'll go for um, with people of no more than six in a group. So uh, today's announcement kind of reinforces that anyway. So we're kind of in line with the government guidance and based on the feedback we had from the barbecue, uh, no one really had an, an appetite, if you'll excuse the pun, for um, Face face meeting. So we thought we'll continue with the Zoom sessions. Um, I'll talk about how that affects the Fashion Festival in that we're now oh, going to go. I'm in with... there. Ah, we have video. Thank goodness for that. Welcome back, Stuart. Um, I've skipped over our guest introduction because she's not online. Oh, why is that? I don't know. <laughs> Using your computer. Uh, so uh, I've skipped over it for now. If she appears, then we can go back. Okay, carry on then. Um, so we'll we're going to do a virtual exhibition. Talk a bit more about that in a moment, and we're <coughs> going to do our gazebo on the Broadway. Uh, again, I'll talk about that as well in a moment. So what about the sessions? So the meetings between now and uh, December, these are the dates. These are all on the website now. And um, you'll see with the symbols on the right hand side, which ones are Zoom and which ones are outdoor. The outdoor ones on the 14th of October, we're going to do some light painting down at the football club. So this would be with um, LED light uh, that will uh, light up trees or cars <coughs> with long exposures. So you'll need tripods, all that kind of stuff. Um, well, again, there's a description of this on the website and I'll be reminding you by email as well. The 25th of November, we're going to do uh, a walkabout in Newbury for nighttime <coughs> photography. We'll do it in groups of six, like we did with the 50 steps. So we'll ask you to register to do it. We'll allocate you to a group and then we'll tell you where that group's going to meet. But essentially, we'll probably have three main meeting points. The uh, canal park area, the uh, high street area and the bridge where the cars are going by so we can do some light trails of cars going by. Now both of those practicals are really low light practicals, they're very similar, but that's pretty much all we're allowed to do at the moment because we're meeting in the evening and the sunset is such that there's not going to be a lot of light around. Um, so that's what we're doing. The 9th of December, we're just going to do a slideshow of the year's activities and we'll ask you to vote for the um, the Chairman's Cup, the, the best of the project vote winners from the year. I've left the microphones open guys so that you know, you're welcome to comment or shout or whatever. So what is a virtual exhibition? Well, it's pretty much no more than a website gallery. But what we thought we'd do is we'll dress it up a little bit, maybe feature it on the website. And we'll only post it between the 10th and the 17th of October for the duration of the Thatcham Festival. Um, 
we're going to ask you to submit five images per member. The reason I'm asking for five will become clear in a moment. Um, but we'd like five images from you. There's no theme. So whatever you want to do that you feel <laughs> represents you in the best light of your photography. I'd like to receive those by the 2nd of October, please. And the reason we're asking for five images is twofold. One, we uh, need to refresh the photos for the hospital displays. And we need five photos from you for that purpose. Come to that in a minute. And also, we're going to do the gazebo on the Broadway event. And we'll have a slideshow running in the gazebo and we'll show that same virtual exhibition photo. So those five photos you're going to submit to us are going to be used for the online exhibition, the slideshow in the gazebo and the hospital display. So we're, we're going to milk those five photos as much as we can. So we don't want to keep coming to you asking for lots of photos. So we're going to reuse these five photos <coughs> as much as we can. We're going to set up across the width of the gazebo, as you see there, there's only one little table. What we're going to do is put tables across the entire width to stop the members of public coming into the gazebo. And that way, the people that are inside the gazebo will be isolated and we'll, we'll space them out along the table so they're not too close and that table will form a, a barrier for us to stop um, <coughs> the risk of people wandering around and breaking the, the rules and regulations. Uh, so we'd like volunteers to help us staff that um, gazebo please. <coughs> if you can do an hour that'd be great. Uh, just tell us and we'll, we'll slot you in to that period for the day. We're probably going to be there 10 in the morning till four in the afternoon. I don't know. We haven't refined that yet, but we'll need to fill those slots throughout the day. So if you can help, that would be great. And we'll slot you in. Um, the reason we're doing this is based on my understanding of what was announced today, I don't think this breaks any rules. It's rather like a market stall, which is still allowed to continue. It's just we're not selling anything over the counter other than ourselves. And that's the point of doing this. It's just to say to the members of the public, hey, we're here, we're still here, we're still going. Um, you can still participate if you wish to. So it's just a, a way of helping the town council uh, because a lot of people are pulling out all sorts of activities for the festival. So it's a way of helping the council and it's also a way of uh, promoting the club under difficult circumstances. The other reason we'd like those five photos is because Alan's running out of prints to put in the hospitals. Um, right. Yes. I assume people in the gazebo will have to wear masks. We're not sure about that yet, Andrew, and guidance may change, but if we have to, we will, but... I, th I, keep... thought, I thought it was at one metre, you had to wear a mask or have a barrier between you. Okay. If you're at two metres, you don't have to wear a mask or have a barrier. Fine. All right. Well, we'll, we'll abide by the rules of the time. Uh, if we can right. get away okay. without wearing masks, then obviously that would be preferable especially as we want to engage people. Um, but yeah, we'll have to play that one by ear. Okay. Ray? Yes? Um, do the prints have to be this year's um, images or can they be unshown ones from previously? Um, for the, the hospital display and the exhibition, the exhibition, it would be nice if it was this year, but obviously you know, we haven't been out and about as much as we would like. So maybe we haven't got as many photos to call upon. So if you can make it this year, but if you can't, then anything goes. Thank you. Um, we, we've, uh, there's no theme on these either, but 
with the hospital, obviously, we try and select the uplifting ones, um, particularly in the renal unit, which can, you know, veer towards end of life care sometimes, not always, but sometimes we like to, um, we like to make it as uplifting as possible. But um, yeah, you can provide five prints. Uh, because we're not doing printed project boats, we run out of prints. So that's why we're asking you for prints. And if you can do four at landscape and one at portrait, then that matches the ratio of slots we've got in the, uh, in the hospital, as you can see with the photos on the right there. Right. Yep. Go ahead, Kevin. Right. Yep. Wouldn't it make more sense to um, have them printed so there's some consistency across the piece so that they're all borderless and they're all A4 mm. and they'll all fit the frames properly whereas on a typical project boat mm. you get a real mix of mm. quality, the printing, mm. borders and sizes. Um, if yep. you have five from each member, if you get a hundred in I'd be surprised. So it wouldn't cost very much to get 100 A4 prints done by DP Colour Labs, less than the cost of a room hire at the uh, football club. Yeah, all good points. But when we look at it over the year, having to replace these prints multiple times over the year, it, the costs do become significant. So for this time round, we thought, uh, the well, you'd have editing. 100, wouldn't you? You'd have, a, you'd have enough to change the displays five, five times, six times. Yeah, but I, I think for this time round, we said, look, it'd be easier and quicker if you guys do the prints. And then we need to look at this for next year, because when we did the numbers, with the number of times we replaced the prints, it starts to get expensive. Now, if we factor that into the costings for next year that's fine but that wasn't really factored in this year so that's why we're asking you guys to do the prints this time around can i ask a question um mm. where would you recommend where would you recommend that we go then to have these printed if if you don't if you can't do them at home um and most color inkjets at home can produce excellent um prints okay uh, you just need to put the right paper in, um, a proper photo paper. Mm. Uh, but if not, then uh, what Paul was referencing to, there are a number of online um, providers. And the problem with, with doing five is that the postage is probably more than the cost of the prints. Um, so you may want to balance doing them online versus going into a local printing place um, on the high street they may charge you more for the prints but the total cost might be less interfering ray last time when i had one printed in the high uh, at tesco's i think yeah. i was horrified at how much they wanted for just one four pounds um, when lynn and i send our photos off together to be printed from the labs we share the postage and it makes it extremely cheap. Yep. Yep. The that other comment it. I would make is if, you, if we were asking you to print 100 photos, I very much have in mind that we've suddenly made a job for somebody that takes time and people forget that somebody has to do the work behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah all of those points are very valid and are part of the reason why we made the decision to ask you guys to do the printing this time round. I'm not okay. saying it, it could be Ray that um, they've got some prints already there, so they don't have to go and print loads of prints. But if they need some new ones printed for this year's prints, but there may be if, if they've got other ones there that's quite capable. Yep, of going in. <coughs> yeah, I mean, um, many of us tend to have a pile of prints lying around. Um, and if you do, then great. Uh, if not, then uh, if you can print them, that'd be great. 
Ray, going yeah. back to Leslie's question, then which, which lab do you recommend if we try and group together to send some off to print? We, we quite like DS Colour Labs, DSCL. If you just Google that, they'll come up. They're, they're, um, they're very good. They're very competitive and they're very quick. They come back real quick. Um, and if you go with a standard offering rather than you know, special paper, if you use their default paper, um, then it's, it's the price for an A4 is pretty reasonable. Okay, thank it, you. It's the postage that sometimes can get you there. Okay. And to clarify, these don't have a border to them. Is that right? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. If, if we oh. prefer not to have a border, if you look okay. at the pictures uh, that yeah. are on the screen, yeah. you'll see what it looks like. And, mm. you know, borders aren't terrible, but it looks nice if they're all consistent. So exactly. If, if you can do it without borders, that would be preferable. Yes, please. And it's an A4. So you may want to look at the cropping of the picture before you print it, rather than let the, uh, the print lab decide that cropping for you. So in Lightroom, Photoshop and other products, you can set the crop to be an A4 crop. So you might want to set that and then look at your print before you actually um, export it as a printable file. And elements too, elements too. Yeah, they all do it um, and it can be useful because an A4 is slightly different aspect ratio to a standard picture. And just to make sure, you know, the wrong bits don't get cut off. <coughs> Um, if sometimes if you want to stick with the aspect ratio in Photoshop elements or Lightroom add black borders on the ends to fill the width if it's a portrait if it's a landscape picture the um, you'll, you'll have extra space on each end and you can fill that with black um, background and that will then print correctly and keep the aspect ratio but um, it looks a little bit better if you don't do that. Question? Okay. Um, so everyone comfortable with those things, what we're going to do, what we're going to get up to, how we're going to do it. Um, I'll remind you, uh, Sue's going to send out a newsletter that will remind you about some of these things. Um, so that will you'll have that in writing. And then uh, I'll also send out the odd email just to remind you uh, what's going on and why. Okay then, strap yourselves in, get ready, because here we go. Uh, I'm probably gonna mute you, mute you all now. Um, have a look. I'm going to mute you all. So you can now unmute yourself if you want to. That's all good. Right. Now, if you want to ask questions, by all means, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. So tonight we're going to look at photo storage. And this came out of the question that um, someone asked me um, and it was kind of interlinked in the I'm running out of room on my laptop for the photos. Should I buy a new one? And if I do buy a new one, how much storage should I buy on it? Uh, or can I expand the laptop I've already got? Can I put more storage on it? Uh, I then also added into the, the mix what's this cloud storage stuff and how does that affect it? So what I'm going to do is go through those elements. It's my view. You may find others that have a totally different view, uh, but I'll give you my view and uh, not saying I'm right and everyone else is wrong. It's just the way I do it. And it suits me to do it that way. Firstly, I just want to spend a moment with the library analogy. 
um, because there's a lot of confusion over what storage and RAM is or memory. So if you think of the shelves of a library, um, that's the storage, the hard drive inside your computer. So the more shelves you've got, the more space you've got for books. So the more storage, the more disk space you've got, the more books you can store in your library. Memory, if you think of that as the table you're sat at. So you're sitting at the table. If you've got a big table, you can have lots of books open and you can be looking at all those books at the same time. If you've got a tiny table, you can only open a few books. Similar in terms of computer memory or RAM as it's sometimes called. Um, if you've got more RAM, you can do more stuff. And the processor, think of that as the librarian in the, the more the librarian moves, the faster the librarian can move, the more work will be done in a given period of time. So the processor, the faster, more powerful the processor, the more work your computer can do. So it's worth understanding the difference between those three uh, and keeping that analogy in your mind because particularly the first two, storage and memory, people do get a little bit confused between the two. Now, you have some options with these. I would say on the last two, memory and processor, get as much as you can. Get the fastest, biggest, that you can afford or you can squeeze into your computer. With storage, you have a couple of options. You can sometimes replace the drive that's inside your computer, or you can add drives inside your computer. Now, if it's a desktop computer, some desktop computers have space inside them, empty space, you can slot another disk inside, another storage device. Uh, laptops don't. So what I was going to do is go through the options um, of upgrading the storage for both cloud-based storage and home-based storage. So let's have a look at what's inside your computer. Now there's lots of numbers on the screen. Please don't get spooked. I'm just going to walk you around them one at a time. So there are two types of storage device inside your computer. Uh, the picture you see is the first one, the hard disk drive. And what that is, is it's spinning disks. You can see in the middle, the silver platters are spinning and there's a little arm that's moving across the surface of those disks. Those disks. And this, these disks are magnetic. And it's a bit like the old tape recorder, the reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. You've got two reels and there's a bit of magnetic tape goes between them. The magnetic tape moves and goes past a read and write head. And that's how you read and write the music from your reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. It's not too dissimilar here. Instead of a tape that's going past the head, you've got a discs that are spinning and the head moves. Uh, and the head goes across the surface of the disc, a bit like the needle on a record, for those of you young enough to remember those things. So a hard disk drive or HDD is the first type and is very common. What's new and beginning to replace those hard disk drives is something called a solid state drive or SSD. And this, I suppose the easiest, quickest way to describe that is think of a memory key. You've got a memory key and you hold, you know, in your hand, there's no power on it, but it remembers the data that you've written onto the memory key. Well, an SSD is kind of similar in that it's all chips inside, no moving parts. And when you put the data on, it stays there, even though you then power the computer off and the data remains there. And a solid state drive is built to pretend to the computer that it's a hard disk drive. The way that it talks to the computer, the way the computer talks to it is exactly the same 
as it would talk to a hard disk drive. So the computer doesn't really know the difference. And that means all the software, Windows or Mac OS, all those things don't have to be told that you've got an SSD. They just write and use it in the way that they would in a normal way. So solid state drives are beginning to emerge. They're quite expensive at the moment. They're not as big in terms of capacity as the hard disk drives yet. And that's partly cost, partly reliability, um, but they're getting there. And if you've got a modern laptop purchased in the last year or two, chances are it's got an SSD inside. We'll talk about some of the advantages of those things in a moment. Typical sizes, let's look at the first one, 256 gigabytes, 256 gigabytes. Now go over to the other side of the screen. How many photos can you get on 256 gigabytes? Well, if you take a 24 megapixel camera and you've got a raw image off it, give or take, it's about 20 megabytes you can squeeze about 10,000 photos onto that drive. Now, it's not all photos you can get on there. If you do the maths, you'll realize that that's only about 200 gigabytes. Where's the extra 56 gone? Well, if you look at the middle at the bottom, what's on it, you've got Windows 10 or Mac OS. You've got the apps that you're using. And you've got your documents, your emails, and your attachments that you've saved. So give or take, that's around 50 gigabytes on a good day. So you've only got about 200 odd, 206 odd gigabytes for your photos. So that's about 10,000 photos. If you've got lots of videos, if you've got lots of music, as well as your photos, that number of photos comes down. And that's where you start to run into troubles because if you've got a laptop with 256 gigabytes on it, 10,000 photos ain't that many. I'm certainly well over 10,000 photos in my library. I suspect you guys are too. So you need to start thinking about how you expand that storage. Now there are more bigger drives. If you look on the bottom left, you'll see that there are, as a one terabyte drive, one TB, that's four times 256. All the way up to eight terabytes, which is 32 times 256. So now you're talking, now you're talking in terms of photo storage. So what's external or USB storage? So this is a disk drive you can plug into your computer, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, doesn't matter. As long as it's got a USB port, you can plug it in. If it's an old computer, the USB port is probably a little bit slower than the modern computer's USB ports. So the, the disk won't run as fast or moving photos back and forth won't be as fast on an older computer as it is on a modern computer. Uh, but nonetheless, you can plug these things in to just about any old computer. There are two types of disk drive in these external things. Again, a hard disk drive or a solid state drive. Um, on terms of the typical sizes, you've got the solid state drives tend to be the smaller ones. So 128, 256, you struggle to get above two terabytes in solid state drives nowadays, but that will change. Yeah, there will be bigger ones coming along, but they are expensive. We'll see that in a minute. But the solid, the hard disk drives, the spinning disk type, uh, you can get quite large drives nowadays. So, for and against. 
Um, an external disk drive like this is very portable. You can put it in a, a filing cabinet and lock it away if you're going away on holiday, if you're not taking things away with you. Um, or if you've got all your photos on one drive and something else on another drive, but you don't need to take everything away on holiday with you, you can lock the drive away in a filing cabinet and you're not taking that on holiday with you where it may or may not get stolen or, or damaged. So uh, being portable is good. Expandable, you need more, plug another one in. You can have more than one of these things plugged in. It's a fixed one-off cost. You buy the drive, that's it, no more cost. Um, you can use this for multiple computers. So you can unplug it from your computer and plug it into another computer. Now, if those that other computer is an Apple or you're using an Apple and you want to plug it into a Windows machine, then there's a few things that you need to do with it before you start. I'm not going to go into that now, but just to make sure it's compatible between Windows machines and Mac machines, you need to prepare the disk in a certain way before you start using it. Um, if you don't have a mixture of computers, it's not a problem, don't need to worry about it. Another advantage, if you've got, say, your entire photo library on one of these things and your computer breaks and you've got to put it into the repair shop, you haven't given them everything you've got. You've got all your photos on the hard drive at home while the computer's in the repair shop. If you can get your hands on another computer, you can carry on working. You haven't lost everything. You're not completely at a standstill because all your photos are on the machine that's in the repair shop. If you upgrade your computer, you just get your new computer, plug your drive in and away you go. No copying, no moving, uh, no, oh my goodness, you know, I can't get the photos off the old machine now. Um, you can just carry on. Now the SSDs, the solid state drives are very robust because there's no moving parts. So they're quite compact and you can, within reason, you can bang them around a bit. There's nothing to break inside within reason. Don't go swimming with them, but they're pretty robust. What are, what are the negative side of using these? There are lots of very cheap, very poor quality drives out there on the market. And that goes for hard disk drives and solid state drives. So be very cautious about buying the cheapest um, because you're going to put all your photos on this. Do you want to trust all your photos to a cheap Chinese knockoff with no quality uh, control? Um, I certainly wouldn't. So get the expensive drives, pay the money, get the expensive drives. And if you're, it's a hard disk drive, then you've got spinning things going on inside it. So if you're going to put it on your desk, put it out of reach. You don't want to be banging it, crashing it while it's working. And I've seen people pick up a hard disk drive and think it's a mouse. And they picked it up, banged it, moved it, slide it, thinking that they've picked up the mouse when in fact they've picked up the hard disk drive. They don't like that. They break. So just treat them with a little bit of respect. And then the other negative, if you like, with them is that you've got to manage all the backups. So if you've got terabytes worth of photos on this hard drive, make a backup because these things break. They, it will break. You can bet your life on it. So make a backup uh, and that's on you. How many photos? Well, because you haven't got the operating system, the apps and your music and your videos and that on it, probably, 
uh, a one terabyte drive, you could put 50 odd thousand raw photos on there. So it now begins to become a serious bit of uh, storage. And the one terabyte drives are not that expensive nowadays. Now the, that 50,000 is an approximate number. It's based on 24 megapixel raw file being approximately 20 megabytes. Okay, so that's USB. And if you're gonna um, do a one terabyte disk, if you wanna back it up, you need another one terabyte disk. Yeah, you basically gotta buy two um, for that very purpose. Or what you could do is you could have your main photo library on a one terabyte disk, you could have your music and your videos on another terabyte disk. You could have a four terabyte disk as your backup for everything. Uh, you can mix and match these in whichever way you want to do it. And what, what you might want to do is that backup drive, um, lock it away somewhere safe, and maybe even not in the house. Because, God forbid, if the house goes up in smoke, if your backup drive is not in the house, then you haven't lost that. Um, I've got a friend who keeps these kind of things in his car, in the boot. Uh, if the car gets stolen or goes up in flames, that's his backup. He's still got the primary and vice versa. So what is cloud storage then? Well, in simple terms, if you look on the left hand side, it's a hard disk drive, the spinny disk type. It's not an SSD. That's a waste of money for this application. Uh, the most cost effective solution is someone somewhere has got a very large building full of hard disk drives like this and you can connect to them and store your stuff on them so it's not at the home it's out there in the cloud so it's typically a hard disk drive typically two terabytes is kind of the minimum uh, but it can go as big as you like um, and there's pricing plans accordingly so it's very expandable uh, you've got a scale of charges, so you pay for what you use. Whereas with the hard drive, the, the USB drive, you might be paying for a drive and you're only half filling it. Um, with a cloud, in theory, you pay for what you use. Although their tiers of pricing kind of makes that irrelevant, but it's a point. Um, one thing that is a very interesting advantage is it can be used with multiple devices, not computers, devices. Come on to that in a moment. It's very robust because it ain't a spinning bit of metal sat on your desk that you can play football with. Um, it's in a very controlled, secure environment, being looked after very well with automatic backups. So they do all the backups for you. However, you are tied to monthly fees. You're going to pay a monthly subscription for the privilege. And you have to have fast internet. So if you don't have an internet connection, you don't have your photos, period. Unless, let's say you're going on holiday, you're not sure what photos are going to be, what kind of bandwidth you're going to have at your holiday place you'll need to copy what you need onto your machine, onto your laptop or onto a USB drive and take it with you. Because if you haven't got the internet connection, you won't be able to get access to your photo libraries. Um, and it needs to be a pretty fast connection. Otherwise, you're going to be spending an awful long time waiting for it to download, particularly with raw files and bigger files. Um, 
sometimes these guys get a bit cheeky with their pricing and what was the best deal today may not be the best deal tomorrow but the challenge there is you've now got terabytes potentially of data that you've got to move from one provider to another before the contract ends before you tell them where to stick it and that takes hours and hours sometimes days so you've got to think and plan ahead if you're going to move providers uh, some providers go out of business some providers get eaten up by other providers all of these things can affect how um, viable this kind of storage is so how much does it cost here we go so let's start top left an external usb drive a hard disk drive spinning metal four terabytes 152 pounds and that's G technology. This is a premier brand. You can get cheaper ones, sure. But personally, I wouldn't go anywhere near them. The only brand I trust is G technology um, because the quality of the drives inside them are excellent. Um, an SSD, so the solid state one, two terabytes is more than double the price. So half the storage, double the price. Uh, this is why you don't find those in the cloud because they're very expensive. Um, but if you get, say, a one terabyte or a smaller one and use it while you're on holiday or portable uh, while you're moving around, uh, they're very good, very portable, very robust, very quick as well. They, the transfer speed if you've got a good USB, a, a latest eight USB connection, the transfer speed is very fast. Um, it's a one-time cost. If you go into the cloud services, believe it or not, the cheapest pretty much out there in the market right now is Apple. Um, you get 50 gigabytes for 79p a month. And that's what I use at the moment. I pay 79p a month. I get invoiced 79 pence a month, but 50 gigabytes is all I need in the cloud. And I'll show you why in a moment. Um, two terabytes is, a, is about seven quid a month. Uh, and contrary to popular belief, you don't have to have a Mac to use Apple iCloud. You can use Windows as well. Dropbox, we're quite familiar with Dropbox. We use it within the club. Uh, you get up to two gigabytes free uh, to be compared. So I'm trying to use two terabytes as the yardstick here. So slightly more expensive than Apple, uh, but obviously completely independent of any manufacturer. So you might feel more comfortable with Dropbox rather than Apple uh, is eight quid a month um, for two terabytes. Google Drive comes next. Um, two terabytes is eight quid a month. But actually, if you pay annually, it's cheaper than that. Uh, if you pay for a year up front. Adobe is a bit expensive. Um, two terabytes will cost you £10 a month. And you can only have it if you buy their photography package as well. So if you're not a subscriber to the Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom photography package, you can't have their cloud service. Sorry. Um, and when you do, it's going to cost you 10 quid a month. Amazon, again, the most expensive at the moment, 13 quid a month. Uh, a little bit less if you pay on an annual contract. Now, before anyone shouts at me, where's Microsoft? Um, Microsoft have an offering but I've looked at it and looked at it and it really really isn't for photographers in my opinion it's aimed at Office 365 users who are doing word processing spreadsheets and presentations uh, yes you could use it for photos but it's not optimized for that the offering 
the subscription service it's all centered around using office 365 if you're an office 365 user then by all means take a look at it if you're not i wouldn't recommend you look at it uh, the icloud dropbox google there's not a lot between all of them they're well worth looking at now here comes the magic you can have your cake and eat it because you can put your main photo library on an external drive a usb drive uh, probably a hard disk drive because that's the cheapest you get more bang for your buck the only real disadvantage of that is don't bang it around don't crash it around treat it with a little bit of respect have a backup but that gives you more bang for the buck in terms of storage capacity but use the cloud for sharing and i mentioned earlier that the cloud allows you to share with devices not just computers so here we've got a tablet and a mobile phone so you can share your photos if you put them up on the cloud you can share your photos on multiple different device types so you keep the library on the external drive on your computer but you're sharing using the cloud and that keeps them separate as well i guess a lot of you have got duplicate folders on your drives uh, maybe the raw files and the jpegs and it's the jpegs that you share with everyone else or that you print um, this way you could keep your main library photos on the external drive and the jpegs for sharing on the cloud and if you look at something like the apple cloud at 79p a month that 50 gigabytes is very viable for that because that's exactly what i do and in fact i use two cloud services and two external USB drives. So I use iCloud for sharing um, my photos on my mobile devices. I've got an iPad, I've got an iPhone, and I use Mac computers. So it's a no brainer to use iCloud to share all of those public photos I'm prepared to show people via the cloud. I use Dropbox for non-family sharing, like the Camera Club. If I want to send you guys a link to some photos, I'll send you a Dropbox link. I won't send you an iCloud link. I keep that for family only. And then the external USB drives, uh, it's a little bit of a different picture to the other one, but it's um, a big uh, drive that I use for primary photo library. So my all the, the galleries for the camera club are on there. All of my raw files are in, on there. Um, and I back up everything onto another device, which is not in the building. So that way I've kind of got the best of all worlds in my opinion. Um, Dropbox doesn't cost me any money because I'm only using it for less than the, um, the minimum amount that you get for free. Um, the iCloud only costs me 79p a month. Uh, so that's really good value. And those external drives cost me money up front, uh, a couple of hundred quid each, but they're there, they've been there for some time and I don't have to worry about ongoing costs. Anyone got any questions? <laughs> Unmute yourself. Hi, Ray. Ray? Yep. Uh, I use the uh, Microsoft OneDrive. Okay. It comes with um, 365. I just upload a copy of all my raw files and keep them there 
Okay. That's all I use it for. So the off offsite storage. Yeah. And then the other thing I've got, which um, didn't really touch is a, I've got a subscription to a company called Backblaze. It mm -hmm. costs me about $60 a month, oh, sorry, $60 a year. And I put a little app on my computer and then it backs up the computer and any external drives I attach to it incrementally all the time. And it's got unlimited storage for that $60 a year. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there, there are many, many things out there that one can use. I use a utility on my computer that does incremental backups to the backup drive that's on the screen now. Um, so, but you can do that to a cloud-based backup service as well. Yeah, I, I do the, the hard drive one as well. Mm. Ray, is your hard drive compatible only to Mac or is it dual compatibility? Uh, the external drives, the prime and the backup, they will connect to anything. Um, yeah, that's interesting because I've got one. I'm thinking of getting a second and after your talk, I definitely will. Um, but my, my, my hard drive backup, um, it's, I've been using it with my Mac for ages and it's all of a sudden it doesn't want to talk to the Mac or the Mac doesn't want to talk to it. So I checked it on my Dell and it's still working with that. So I think it's the Mac that's not talking to it. But I'm having trouble with a download at the moment or an upload, whatever they, you know, as every now and again, you get an upload from Apple and it doesn't seem to want to go on. So I don't know if that's anything to do with it. Well, it, it's, yes, it's, it's a fair thing to say. And this applies to Microsoft as well. Sometimes when they apply updates to your system, particularly if your drives are old, they may drop off the list of supported devices. So, they may not want you to use those anymore and that's kind of tough because they drop you in it you know one minute it's working next minute it ain't yeah. um so i would always be cautious about that and the best thing i can say is and this is probably not a bad practice anyway is every few years buy a new backup drive mm -hmm and get a new latest current one because then it's going to be supported on the latest versions of windows yeah. and mac os um, so if you've got a drive that's donkey's years old but it's still working great but two things one it, it's time to failure may not be as long as you want it to be and or it may drop off the supported device list next time you upgrade your computer um so you need to be it's a bit like the old you know all my movies are on vhs and now i don't have a vhs player so it's a little bit like that with hard drives external any external device i had to buy a new uh wacom tablet recently yeah. uh, that i use for my photoshop editing because the other one i had admittedly it was 10 years old still working perfectly but all of a sudden apple dropped it off its supported list and it no longer worked so same applies to external hard drives as well and the other thing i would say is um the the backup software i use the incremental backup software i don't know about yours andrew but i've got a bit of a thing against backup software that compresses the files that turns it into like zip files and things and the reason is that the backup software that a lot of the backup software that does that it's a proprietary system and if that company goes out of business or if they suddenly decide not to do something your backups might be useless so what i do with my backup software is it copies everything, it mirrors everything. So it copies all the files as they are without changing or modifying them, without compressing them. So it literally, those two drives you see, the prime and the backup, mm. are literally copies of each other. They are identical. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and that way, if if all else fails, if you know everything gets thrown out with the bathwater, I can take that backup drive, plug it just about into anything, and get everything back. No, the one I use, Ray, is called Carbon Copy Cloner. That's exactly what I use, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, and it, it just makes a complete clone, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Carbon Copy Cloner is um, is a very good program. I've looked it works for, very nicely on the Mac. Yeah, when I when I had a win, a lab a Windows laptop, I looked for something an alternative, and I couldn't really find anything that did exactly the same for Windows. Ooh. Yeah. So Windows has its own backup routine. I wouldn't use it because I've had it in the past at work where someone's done that. You then end up upgrading the system. You can't get the backup. Um, so with, at least with something like Carbon Copy Cloner, that admitty that's Mac only, but try and find something with Windows that does something similar. Um, because you can then always go into the backup drive and actually see the files and poke them. Uh, without anything special. Um, so, and I've done that. I've gone into the backup drive, found the file that I, like an idiot, I deleted, and I've pulled it over. Um, so, yeah, there are a few oh. gotchas there. For Windows, I use Ease Us. It does cloning, it does cloning of hard drives, it does partitioning of hard drives, and you can get a lifetime upgrade. Great. It's on it as well. Great. So there's some good intelligence there for you guys on that. So it is a little bit of a minefield and, you know, I may have lost some of you by now, but don't despair. Um, if you're confused, just drop me an email and I'll go through it for you. Um, because it is a bit of a minefield. The other little twiddle on this, which I've not, I didn't want to over confuse you, but just so you're clear, the prime and the backup devices you see here, they're actually not connected by USB, they're on the network. So they are network servers. Um, they're called NAS, Network Addressable Storage. Um, and basically all it is, is a hard drive inside a box, and instead of a USB cable coming out the back, it's got a network cable. So you just plug it into your router, and it works exactly the same as a USB drive. It's just on the network. Right. And that way I can access it from any of my computers, Windows or otherwise. And so can the family. Ray, how easy is it to pull your photos from the cloud over to an external drive? It's drag and drop. Uh, I, I just use drag and drop to do that. Um, and it's very easy to do. Um, in fact, you know, if you really want me to, I will show you. I'm going to show uh, my entire desktop now. So with Lightroom, Ray, when you open your Lightroom, it's accessing all the pictures on the NAS storage. Yep. Do you find it slows it down at all? Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what, what I tend to do uh, with, with these external drives, if you've got a fast USB and you've got a, a fast USB on your computer and you've got a fast hot drive, um, the, the performance is amazing. Uh, SSD is even better. You probably can't tell the difference between the hard drive inside your computer and an SSD plugged into a USB port. But... Um, that's not what I've got. Um, so my, um, can you still see the slide on the screen now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I tend to do is if I'm, uh, like tonight, this presentation, I was working on the presentation on my laptop. I prepared everything. I copied it over to the prime uh, network device you see here. And then I went to my desktop computer and I copied that folder onto the desktop of my desktop computer. And I'm running that tonight from a copy that sat on the computer itself for that very reason, Andrew, that sometimes the performance over the network 
to these devices can be variable. Um, but generally a USB device is a little bit better than that. And if I show you the, um, just going to bring up a new window here. And if you look here at um, my photo library, so this is my photo library I'm looking at. Um, so here's um, Haver Castle. There's all my raw files. Yeah, you can see all this, guys. Yeah, you can see that? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So there's all my raw files. Um, now I'm going to open up another window. And I'm going to go here. And I'm going to go to um, I haven't got any photos on here. Oh, yes, I have. Where have I got the photos? Okay, that's boring. All right, let's go to Dropbox instead then. So here's Dropbox. Here's the training folder from 2019. There's a digital basics course we ran in 2019. Now this particular window here I just accessed, you saw how fast that was. That was Dropbox, that was Cloud. This one here, the Heva Castle with all my raw files, that was this prime device on the network. So as you can see they're all pretty quick. Now if I wanted to I could take this and copy it over to Dropbox just by dragging and dropping. And here it is. And now here's the copy happening. 1.2 gigabytes. You can see how fast that's copying from this prime device here. I'm now copying from this device on the network through my computer over to Dropbox here on the cloud. Is that actually going to Dropbox or is that just copying it to the Dropbox computer? folder on your computer at the moment. It's doing a, a copy, so it's moving files. So you'll see the files here. It's, it's in process, but it's copying 1.2 gigabytes worth of data. Yeah, but they're still on your computer, aren't they? They haven't synced to the cloud yet. Not yet, no. No, it's what it's doing is it's copying over into a folder on the computer and then it will sync to the cloud. Yeah, I think what Ray was asking was how fast it would you could upload them to the cloud. Yeah. Oh. Currently all my photos are, are mainly on the cloud. Okay. I've got an hard drive, so an external hard drive. So I want to take the photos from the cloud and put them straight onto the hard drive, external hard drive. Right. You can drag and drop in the way that I just did um, from the find the directory on the cloud device and drag and drop them onto the external device plugged into your computer. So it's not technical to do it. You just have to wait. So now that has copied the files onto my computer and now you'll see this little symbol is saying that it's now syncing that with the cloud and they go to ticks, little green ticks. You see that one there is a green tick, here's another one. So it sits there in background copying. So it'll take a while, right? Is the bottom line. It'll take a while. Do it before you go to bed and then wake up in the morning and it's all done. <laughs> yeah. yeah like the house work <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so i'm going to kill that because i don't want another gigabytes of data on my uh, dropbox account yeah but that's it's drag and drop and windows is the same you just find the folders you want to move drag and drop them you uh, can delete the hard copy you can un I know with the iCloud one, you can right click on the copy on your machine, delete that, but still leave it in the cloud, can't you? Yes, you can. You do that with Dropbox? 
If you delete it from this Dropbox folder here, you're deleting it. If you haven't got it anywhere else on your computer, then you've lost it. Right, because with, so, with the iTunes one, you get a little symbol that says it's still in the cloud, don't you? Yes. Yes, the iTunes is a bit more sophisticated there. Right. I didn't know whether you could do that with Dropbox as yeah, well. Yeah, Dropbox. So, for example, um, this was okay because I dropped this, this folder here from the Prime server. And when I picked it up and dragged it, you'll see it's got the plus, the green plus there. That means it's going to copy. Um, so the original folder here was unaffected. But if I go to um, my desktop, say, and I've got this photo here, if I just drag that into here, you'll notice it doesn't have the green plus symbol. That's a move. So it's going to move it from the desktop into the Dropbox folder. If I then delete it from the Dropbox folder, it's gone. I've deleted it from the computer. What happens if you right click on one of the folders in the Dropbox thing? Do you have the option to delete the hard copy? No, you don't, do you? Doesn't look like it, no. All right, okay. I find Dropbox very dangerous. I won't use it. It is dangerous. You've got to be real careful. However, if you're using an external drive like this Prime Drive, whether it's USB or network attached, doesn't matter. Generally, when you drag and drop from that to Dropbox, it's a copy, not a move. So you're, you're protected. It's only when you're copying from the computer itself to Dropbox that is actually more dangerous. But, you know, without... Also, when you try to copy from Dropbox, and as I try to do, as Sue will tell you, um, and then I adjusted a couple of files and then saved it, and the Dropbox one lost it, but I'd copied it to my computer. I thought the original would stay up in Dropbox, but it didn't. No, it's easy to do. Um, so, yeah, Dropbox is a little bit dangerous. You've got to be careful with it. Um, but... You know, I'm, I'm comfortable with it now, and uh, I'm touching a lot of wood here. I haven't had a situation recently um, where that's a problem. And that's primarily because I don't keep much on the computer at all. Um, I keep everything on these drives. The only thing I move to the computer is a working folder. If I'm working on stuff like tonight, the presentation for tonight, getting all the graphics and everything together, um, the slideshows. I made a copy of all that on the computer, on the desktop. But that's the only time I have that copy. When I'm done tonight, I will update everything on the server, on the, on the uh, external drive, and delete it from the computer. So my computer has got very little on it at all. Um, Do you have your Lightroom catalog on the computer? Yes, you have to. Um, you have to have the cat. You can put the catalog on a USB drive. Um, can be a memory key or the storage drive itself. But you can't use um, the NAS. So well, you I can do a backup of all your catalogs anyway. So I can't put I can't put my Lightroom catalog on this. But I could if it was one of those a USB attached one. Uh, it's a little wrinkle in, in the Lightroom stuff. Um, so, uh, but I, so I keep the Lightroom catalog on the computer and all the photos on the primary device. But there's nothing on this computer. So, God forbid, if anyone came in and stole the computer, um, I wouldn't lose a great deal of data at all. Everything is on these devices. And they're all backed up um, and the backup is not in the same location as the primary so uh, even if the backup or the primary gets found and stolen or trashed i've limited my uh, my risk uh, yeah, so i keep uh, a hard 
I, I've got a four terabyte drive that I keep a copy of everything on at work. Yeah. Yeah, that works. Or you put it in a metal filing cabinet and lock it when you go out. That's, I do that with some stuff as well. Um, you can't do that with these things though, because they're producing heat. Okay, look, uh, we've probably done that to death. If anyone's totally confused, this will be recorded. It is being recorded, so that will be up. But if you really want to talk it through with someone, then by all means, get in touch with me. Or I'm sure, Andrew, you wouldn't mind if someone gets in touch with you, Malcolm. These guys, um, they all do similar things. So there is expertise within the club to help you if you're totally confused or lost. There is another SSD drive that you can think about, which if you've got a modern computer, it's called an NVMe M2 SSD drive. And it's like a RAM chip and it fits on your motherboard. Yeah. So it doesn't need a space in your computer to have a hard drive. And a one terabyte um, NVM is about £92. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of options. The, the price point of these things is going to plummet <clears throat> storage is the cheapest thing out there to be honest at the moment um, and the price is falling on a daily basis almost but just be careful don't get the cheap brands get something get something you know and I, I'm a fan of G technology um, these guys yeah because um, they're Western digital drives and the ones uh, I've got in here, there's a Western digital drive in these and they're server grade drives. So they're designed to run 24 seven. So they're even more expensive than regular drives because they're designed uh, to be robust and last a long time. And I would urge you, if you're gonna trust these devices with all of your photo libraries, then don't cheap out. Pay, yeah, all pay my drives in. are WD NAS drives. Yeah, so pay a bit extra. And if you get a GTEC, uh, it's got a WD drive inside. Uh, this device has got a WD drive inside. The SSDs I talk about, uh, GTEC don't make them. Uh, they're a hard disk drive company. Um, I think they will change that, but Right now, probably the best brand out there is SanDisk. Samsung. Or Samsung, yeah. Western Digital do a, lit a couple of little ones, but they don't get very good reviews. Yeah. All right, we've done that to death. Let's have some entertainment now, shall we? Yeah. Um, so I have got, let's get rid of that. So this is the 50 steps um, slideshow. So it's five seconds on each. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So this is just going through all the photos submitted during the 50 steps. So it's a mixture of Snellsmoor, um, the town centre and uh, Thatcham Lakes. This will last about five minutes. And then the lockdown pictures is slightly shorter. Look at the reflection through the droplets. Some good pickies, guys. Yeah. It's 
I wonder if that's still standing. <laughs> Does my bum look big in this? Nice picture, Paul. Good old waitress. Branches everywhere. Oh. <laughs> Good juxtaposition. Right, I think that was the end of that one. Yep, some really good pickies there. And now this is uh, lockdown. I like the way they widened the path so you can two-way flow two meters apart. That was clever. Oh, 
Oi. There you go. What's that? A big box of chocolates that Angie had on the couch beside her. You still on, Angie? Yes, it was indeed. It's been last it was the though. biggest box I've ever seen. That was quite near the beginning of lockdown, I have to say. <laughs> What have you bought since then? Then <laughs> that was that was the comfort eating. <laughs> the uh, after effects are still there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, all it remains for me to do is to say that our next meeting is on the thirtieth of September, and uh, we'll do the vote for Windows. If you can get your pickies to me by the 25th, that would be great. Thank you. I'll take it, yeah. And then that is it. See you on the 30th. Any more questions before we close the meeting? You know that, um, Ray, you know that uh, four terabyte drive? Is yep. it divided into four one terabytes or? No. It's no, all in one. Well, it's entirely up to you. You can format it how you like. All right. Um, but without getting too technical, there are some limitations depending on how current your machine is. But if you're on Windows 10 mm. or Mac OS, then there aren't any real limitations. But if you want to be able to use the drive between a Windows machine and a Mac machine, then there are a few limitations. Okay. Yeah. Generally, they come in a format that you can use on either machine these days. But what? But the Mac, the the default Mac OS formatting is faster. So what I've going back to Stuart's comment. What I've done before now is I've taken a four terabyte drive and partitioned it into two terabytes and made one half for the Mac system and one half for the PC system so I could yeah. use the drive with both computers. And then you can drag and drop between them. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that helps. It, it really depends on your environment. Um, and also you could, um, for example, I, with the drive that's on the network, the primary that I'm using, I've partitioned that so that I've got the um, camera club on one partition, my photo library on another, the <coughs> home drive for all of our family stuff on another. Um, 
my son-in-law has a partition for his stuff so you can partition these things in any way that suits you right. okay. once you've partitioned it you can't really adjust it all that much no not without reformatting the whole drive yeah yeah and the problem with partitioning is it let's say a four terabyte drive and you partition it to four one terabyte partitions <coughs> that's it you can't to, to change that into two two terabyte partitions is a lot of work and um not for the faint-hearted so it's best to leave it as it is that's the yeah i my feeling is that although you know andrew's approach is perfectly valid because um you know if you do have to move between different machine types then it is handy to be able to do that yeah i haven't got that anymore yeah. i'm mac only now yeah well, that was there you go yeah i've just got a so i you buy the g tech i buy drives by a company called lace technology they see las -E. yeah. and they have seagate drives inside yeah and i've got a five terabyte one of those attached and i've got another five terabyte that it just clones it to i i had a problem with lacy um i don't think it was their problem i think it was probably me in that it was um an external drive and it had a fingerprint recognition on it all oh, right so, so you like your finger. secure the thing and unlock it with a fingerprint and uh, back to earlier talking about system upgrades the system upgrades disabled the fingerprint recognition so i couldn't actually get into the drive um, so in the end i i actually took the drive out and nuked it and then put it in a new enclosure and it's a one terabyte drive that's now just a, a one terabyte USB drive yeah. you know, that I use. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of these features like security, fingerprint recognition, all that, you can get them on these external drives. And it sounds like a great idea, but actually be careful with the software upgrades um, because they can disable some of this stuff. Um, especially if it's software driven security um, I ended up, i've got a usb key that's got a little keypad on it and the security to get into that usb is all within the usb so i can use that on a television uh, usb port doesn't matter the security still works because it's driven by a keyboard actually on the side of the key um, if you use uh, software based encryption uh, like some of these drives offer you when you buy them it's got software encryption on and it says oh secure your data and you think oh that that's a great idea my experience over both windows and mac uh, upgrades over the years is the upgrade disables the encryption software and you're buggered unless you've got a down level machine available that you can quickly go in and scoop all the data off so my advice would be don't um don't use the encryption provided with these drives would be my my advice okay. and my tip would be if you think you've got enough backups buy one more hard drive <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely i remember back at work um i was supporting NatWest. I was looking after the hardware of their branch computer systems. So they had a, a small branch computer by today's standards. I suppose you can see you guys. Uh, it's kind of a, a little mainframe, small mainframe in, in the branch. And uh, they had terrible troubles and this machine was down for a week. Uh, they could not get the machine fixed. We changed all the hardware. We spent a week trying to resolve this system. Turned out that the backups were corrupted. And the backups have been corrupted for years. No one had ever tried to restore the backup to see if it worked. 
Um, and this was one of the reasons why I stopped using backup routines that do compression. Because with my backup routine and the one Andrew uses, I can go into that backup drive and see the file. I can go in and open it and know that it's there and it works. Whereas when you're using these so-called clever backup utilities, you never know until you try and restore it. <laughs> By then it's too late. Okay, guys, let's call it a day. Um, yeah. uh, there is loads of, there's seven chats. Um, I'll have to go through those. No one's asking a question now. So, good. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Bye. 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 Bye.